Aloha and welcome to Pigments, the Power of Imagination. That's episode five of season one. And I'm glad you're here with me. I hope you're here with me. I know a few people are, like my family. Today we're going to talk about mission effects in celebrating and how you celebrate victory in your mission. So uh, why, how did this come to mind? The on reality give, format gives me a lot of freedom about what I choose. And this came to me as I was cleaning the house. <laughs> I was on a mission. Why was that a mission? It was because my family just returned from six weeks in Chile. And so last week I had to be on a mission to complete six weeks of house cleaning in three days. And by golly, I did it. So I'm pretty happy about that and very happy to have them back. Um, I think it is important that we set the stage for uh, this episode the way we always do by talking about the nature of on reality. This is not a political commentary, it never is. And uh, I want to avoid the vitriol of politics and just comment on things that I think are of value. Not because I know everything or not that I want to preach to you, but I think I've learned a few things in my long life, some through doing things right and many through doing things not so right. Um, and that's what led me to want to talk about being on a mission. Um, what is being on a mission? What is a mission? Well, there are multiple, de uh, multiple definitions of a mission. Uh, it can be a specific task or objective, um, a definitive military task. In my 33 years in the Air Force, I've had a lot of definitive military tasks. And uh, it can be a calling or vocation. Your mission in life can be that calling or vocation. It can be a religious mission. What I like to think about is a pre-established, often self-imposed objective or purpose. Um, that whole mission thing. I think it's very important to us. I think it sometimes becomes a, an obsession. It's what the center, what your life is centered around. And it can be self-serving or selfless. I've had several missions. Uh, my first real mission in life, other than staying somewhat out of trouble, was to fly. I wanted to fly, and you've seen in previous ep episodes of Figments, The Power of Imagination, how that all happened. That led to being on a mission to serve honorably in the military. That led to adjusting that mission as I rose into leadership positions, not to achieve personal success, that was still an ambition, but to create successful subordinates. And I found that far more rewarding when one of my principal gains, principal goals rather, was to go to work every day trying to achieve the unit mission by creating successful subordinates. Because if the people who, you, who work for you are successful in their own right, guess what? The organization is going to be successful. Children are a mission. <laughs> they often facilitate their own mission success more than the parents do, certainly in my case, but uh, they can be a mission. Personal happiness is a mission for some. It's been a mission for me. And I'd, I'd like to go back to the notion that some missions can be selfish and some can be selfless. And personal happiness, I've found, can be a very negative uh, mission to have. If all you're seeking is your own happiness and you don't tie your own happiness to a, a higher calling, a better outcome, to serving others, then... First of all, you'll never achieve it. You won't be really happy. Happy, And secondly, you'll do some things in life that you later regret, and I certainly have. Material possessions or a big bank account can be a mission. But again, I don't see how that can be a good thing. And, and I saw, I like my vehicles, for example, my motorcycle and my Mustang, but that can't be your mission. It can be window dressing, if you will, for your life, but it's not enough. To, uh, to sustain you, to make you truly happy. Uh, community service and service to others is something that uh, can be a very positive mission to have and something to seek. And that leads me to what the real inspiration besides the six weeks of cleaning in three days 
what the inspiration for this episode of Figments on Reality was. I had a chance to have lunch with an Air Force fighter pilot whom I had worked with but never met. Thanks, Zoom. Um, and uh, we met and had lunch and got to know each other. We'll call him Slider because he goes by Slider. So that's a good reason. It's a great Air Force fighter pilot nickname and I'll share the origins of that if we have time at the end. But I found him to be bright, funny, irreverent, uh, sort of a typical fighter pilot. But he also had a compelling sense of purpose and focus that certainly isn't unique, but it was compelling. Um, as we spoke, as we got to know each other, he talked about a church mission that he'd been on as a young man. And that mission had clearly impacted him and had lasting positive effects. And I'm not a huge fan of organized religion. Certainly there are pluses and minuses, um, but I think church missions, when they're service oriented and not conversion to the faith oriented, that can be a second order objective, I guess, uh, are, are positive and leave a lasting effect on the young person who completes it. I also reflected on people I've known who have been in the Peace Corps. And um, I've known quite a few. Many of them were diplomats. And I would just say this, they, and I'm generalizing, but they, if their first job was serving in the Peace Corps overseas, often in a remote and impoverished environment, seemed to have something special about them a selflessness, a commitment, an adaptability to changing circumstances that just makes them better people, makes them better at whatever mission they've gotten in the uh, diplomatic community. And, uh, and I think about that a lot because I've known so many of them and it always, uh, it always strikes me that they are special folks so let's talk about being on a mission and choosing your mission wisely. Um, those who have missions that matter, or maybe even that don't matter, are affected by the pursuit of that mission, how they execute it, and the outcome. And they're often affected by second order consequences. Um, and, and this is a concept that I think a lot about, and I'll, I'd like to give you the definition there. Second order effects are, uh, are defined as something that is a consequence of the original consequence. So to the first order, every action has a consequence and to the second order, every consequence has its own consequence. Changing some aspect, this is, is a, a quote that I found online, <laughs> the fount of all wisdom, the internet. Changing some aspect of a complex system, and life is full of complex systems, always introduces second order effects. Some of which may be antithetical to the original intent of the change. In other words, if you embark on a mission, achieve your original objectives, then there are got bound to be second order effects. And sometimes those are not good and they're not helpful. For example, we're witnessing tragic second order effects of our original military mission in Afghanistan. Now, now I was in the Pentagon on September 11th and supported Operation Enduring Freedom, the Afghanistan mission early on, not in country, but in other parts of the Middle East and South Asia. Um, and we needed to be there. We need to, needed to deny a sanctuary, I believe, to Al Qaeda and the Taliban. But the way it was pursued created some really tragic second order effects. But the latest approach to improving vaccine rates is another one where we might consider the second order effects. Now, getting more people vaccinated, and if you're not, I encourage you to get vaccinated. Uh, against COVID-19, especially with the Delta variant in the mix, 
is a good objective. It's a mission worth pursuing, and I hope we succeed in that pursuit. But one of the ideas has been, that has been put forth has been the use of cash incentives for those who get vaccinated currently, not those of us who already did it early on. I don't care about that. It isn't so much about who gets the incentive or who doesn't to me. It's about what's the second order effect of making people wait for an incentive to get vaccinated. What happens with the next pandemic or outbreak? Are people going to delay getting vaccinated in their self-interest to get some form of compensation? That would be a pretty normal human response and it would be a negative second order effect of incentivizing vaccines. So when you choose your mission, it's not enough simply to make it selfless and to make it a matter of serving others. You've got to consider what next. And really, third and fourth order, what next and what next and what next? Because I'm pretty sure that's where we are in Afghanistan. So um, you choose your mission, consider your, your objective, make it uh, something of service. You'll be happier, says me, from my own experience, good and bad. And then consider the, the, the sequels if you will. Once you achieve your mission, it's a natural thing to want to celebrate. And I've been lucky enough to celebrate a successful mission. Um, and for example, in uh, the air war over Serbia, where we were trying to uh, stop ethnic cleansing of uh, Kosovo, Albania and Kosovo, Muslim people in the province of Kosovo, that was a worthy mission, and I got to stand on the stage with the President of the United States after we achieved it and celebrate what? My role? No, I felt good about my role, but that's not what we were celebrating. Celebrate the victory over tyranny and oppression and the role that the folks who worked for me at Aviano played in that victory. And um, that was a good celebration worth doing. Once again, second order comes into effect because nothing was simple after disrupting, if you will, the complex system in Serbia that had led to the original oppression. And that we're still not done. I think we have a moral obligation to see those things through when we initiate the change. So that, that's one way to celebrate. I don't often look to sports figures to see an, object, an example of how to uh, celebrate, but there's one worth looking at. I encourage you to, to uh, take a look at this if you haven't already. Um, I'm a Wisconsin native, a cheesehead, and uh, so of course I was avidly watching the Milwaukee Bucks, Bucks in six, as they won the NBA championship. It's already a big sports fan, of Giannis Ananinkumpo, originally from Nigeria, then Greece, now Milwaukee. <laughs> he's a compelling personality. Uh, he's imminently likable. And if you see any video interviews, anything of Giannis, I, I'm pretty sure you'll agree. He's also extraordinarily articulate. And he's likable and articulate, not for an athlete, but for a human being. He really is a compelling person. In the pursuit of this championship in Milwaukee, which hadn't won one for 50 years, um, he talked repeatedly about doing it for the team and more importantly, for the city of Milwaukee and the community that he'd become part of. He signed a contract extension when he could have gone to super team and made more money and stayed in Milwaukee with the team that drafted him and did so because of his mission to bring that championship to Milwaukee. And it wasn't easy. They were arguably the best team in the NBA for two years and then fell short in the playoffs. And uh, this year they did it. Um, and when they did it, Giannis celebrated in a unique way. And this is something you just have to Google. Um, Giannis went as hopefully you saw in the graphic, 
to Chick-fil-A. Wanted some food, hungry the morning after the victory. And he went there with his wife, a girlfriend actually, and uh, with the two trophies, the NBA championship trophy and the uh, finals most valuable player trophy. He pulled up to the window filming it live on Instagram. And uh, at Chick-fil-A, I guess they have some, uh, a, somebody who takes your order in person out at the car. They don't make you talk into the speaker. Mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of efficiency, not personality. And he said to the young lady who's taking this over, say, you don't mind if I put you on my Instagram live on camera, do you? And she said, no. He said, well, there are 150,000 viewers right now. And that was probably an understatement. Certainly many, many more have seen it on YouTube or Instagram since then. And he ordered 50 chicken minis. 50 years, and he scored 50 points in the final game. He said, not 51, not 49, 50 chicken minis. And then he drove up to get his order. His car was surrounded by, uh, by fans. He let one of them reach in the window and touch the trophy. <laughs> but this was a celebration that he shared with others. And I'm sure he was personally happy and proud that he achieved it. Um, but he wasn't selfishly happy he had achieved it uh, and it is worth watching there's also an interview where he talks about ego pride and humility and how ego is about the past and pride is about the future humility is about doing your best in the moment yanasana and kumbo is somebody we should look to for how to find a mission and execute it. Yeah, you know, he's just an athlete, but I think he's a special guy with a compelling story, and I hope you'll take a look at it. And the reason I tie mission and the effects of your mission to celebration is because I'm troubled by one notion of celebration in our society. Uh, many of you know that one of my missions has been inclusive, in, uh, inclusiveness and uh, diversity especially with regard to women, peace, and security. And I'll let my record stand for that. I've walked that talk and uh, it's very important to me. But when I look at some of the discussion and coverage of inclusion activities and efforts, I'm all for them. A phrase that's often used is celebrate who we are. Well, who you are doesn't matter. I mean, you're a human being. There are only billions of them on the planet. And as an individual, your personal humanness, to me, is not very important. What would you do with your humanity, I think, is very important. What you do with your mission is really important. So I'd like to talk about somebody that during my military service, I felt was worth celebrating. And his name was Bob LeBlanc. I was the squadron commander of the world famous Triple Nickel Fighter Squadron, America's greatest fighter squadron at Luke Air Force Base, Arizona. We had some awesome fighter pilots, other great members of the team. And during the time I was the commander, the team, the squadron did very well. Guess whose fault it wasn't? It wasn't my fault that we did very well. And I think the person that had the most impact of all of the great people I served with there was a retired Air Force senior non-commissioned officer named Bob LeBlanc. He had a really important role. He drove the squadron truck. <laughs> Doesn't sound very important, does it? When I say the squadron truck, Bob LeBlanc drove the truck that took the pilots to and from the airplanes because the parking ramp was a ways away from the squadron. And of course, being Arizona, it was kind of warm there. But Bob didn't just drive the squadron truck. He made it his mission. And uh, he executed with passion and total commitment every day. And I, ha I hadn't known him before I came to be the commander. I came from another squadron. But Bob would drive us out to the, our jets. We'd be focused on the mission and probably not particularly warm or communicative with Bob. But every time he dropped every pilot off at his F-15, Bob would say, 
have a safe flight. And he meant it. And he reinforced the emphasis on flying safety that we had. When he picked us up after a mission, remember it's hot in Arizona. And for those of you who've never flown a 9G capable jet fighter, it's pretty hard work physically. You really have to be an athlete to some degree. And so we'd land and Bob would give each pilot a cold, ice cold towel to wipe down with. And it was awesome. His mission was this, was the squadron's mission. One day, uh, Bob came back from taking some pilots back from the jets. And he came to my office, the squadron commander's office, and said, Colonel Leaf, I was Lieutenant Colonel at the time, I'm worried about Colonel so-and-so. Colonel so-and-so was uh, an officer, a senior officer, a real colonel, going through an F-15 requalification uh, course, as they do if they've been in a non-flying job. He said he didn't look, Bob said, he didn't look good getting out of the flight, out of the jet. He looks a little shaky and his color wasn't good. Bob's the truck driver, not the flight surgeon, but he's committed to the squadron mission. So I, I trusted Bob by then. I knew him well enough that he, this is not something he'd overreact to or make up, certainly. And so we got Colonel So and so to the flight surgeon, a real doctor. And it turned out he did have a medical issue. It wasn't a major thing, but probably shouldn't have been flying. And they got him treated and he returned to the flying program and got requalified and went off to be a senior leader in an Air Force fighter wing. That was striking to me. Bob's just a truck driver, but he was so much more. And he embodied how I wanted people in the squadron to, to be in terms of their commitment to the mission, regardless of their job. So we celebrated him, celebrated Bob LeBlanc, gave him an award in front of the whole squadron, explained to people the role he had. And that's really when the squadron took off in terms of overall unit performance. Bob LeBlanc had far more to, to do with that than I did. And it was worth celebrating. And that's the kind of thing we should celebrate. Not our simple existence or the details of our existence, whether they be any thing we use to define a human being, but what we do with that. And uh, so my advice to you, not that you asked for it, but you did tune in, so you're going to get it anyway, is to have a mission and understand what that mission is. Think about it and be committed to it. Make sure you choose your mission wisely and that it's something that serves more than only you. Um, I think that's important. Fortunately, we have time to talk about Slider, who got his nickname when he was on a mission, on a combat mission on his first combat deployment as a brand new flight lead, or I'm sorry, wingman in the F-15E. And they were flying over Iraq, I believe, if I remember the story correctly. And there were some friendly troops in big trouble being attacked by insurgents and at great risk. There was a ground controller uh, guiding them to the target so they could expend their bombs and, uh, and eliminate the threat. And, you know, this, that's war, folks. It's a dirty business. It's a tragic business. But Rendley's were in trouble, and, he had, uh, and Slider was a wingman on a two ship that had to take care of business. Slider heard the controller clear him to drop all of his ordnance on the threat. Unfortunately, Slider's flight lead, knowing that he had a brand new wingman flying with him, did not hear that. And uh, so when Slider rolled in on the target and expended all of his ordnance and eliminated the threat, the flight lead thought he had dropped without, um, without clearance to do so and basically went berserk on the radio. Eventually, it was all cleared up. They reviewed the tapes, recognized that he dropped with clearance, and did a really good job on a very early combat mission for the then young aviator. SLIDER is an acronym. It stands for screw lead, I'll drop everything regardless. And he was on a mission in difficult circumstances, and he achieved that mission. Nah, 
let's not ignore the second and third order consequences, but Slider inspired me to think about my missions, to reflect on others I've seen who have missions that were worth pursuing. And I'll use that and make sure that my missions aren't just three, uh, six weeks of house cleaning in three days. So I would like to thank you for tuning in. I hope you have found this thought provoking and maybe inspiring, that'd be great. Uh, our next Think Tech uh, presents Figment's The Power of Imagination a week from today on the 9th of August will be with my niece, Julie Wade. She's also on a mission. She also says she's hilarious and she's going to have to prove it. But what I know she is, is a good person who's made her mission helping others. And she's an or she describes herself as ordinary, normal, regular. I don't think you'll find her that way at all. I think you'll find her awesome, inspiring, and I hope hilarious. So thanks to Think Tech for allowing me to do these shows. I'd like to remind you that Think Tech Hawaii is very like totally uh, reliant on donations to uh, produce this and the 30 talk shows a week that they put on their website. And you can find something about almost anything on Think Tech Hawaii. So please go to their webpage, consider donating, and I will see you in seven days and think on uh, figments, the power of imagination with my niece. Mahalo and aloha. <laughs>